So it's about 25 years ago. I'm a young physician just starting out to work with patients with drug and alcohol disorders. And this guy, this heroin patient, tells me, you know, taking heroin is like being hugged by mom. And I found that very moving and very fascinating. But of course, at the same time as I was starting out as a young physician, I was also beginning to train as a neuroscientist to understand the problems of addiction. And I had already learned that solid, serious scientists don't do science by anecdote. And so I put this away in the touchy-feely part of my brain, and I went back to my other life to study the rats that would help me understand addiction. A bit of a pity, because if I had stepped back and thought about it, it would have been pretty obvious that patients with addictions have particularly strong incentives to seek things that will make them feel like being hugged. They're not getting a lot of hugs from the rest of us. Sometimes art captures these things better than almost anything. This is from a beautiful, beautiful song by the rapper Everlast. It's called What It's Like. And the image is from the music video. And if you look around, if the other people around this guy are us, we're either looking with a hostile look or looking away. So I think I didn't get it at the time fully the impact of this, and it didn't connect with my work on the brain. I wasn't alone. It's like there are two different universa out there. And it's not like there's no people studying the connection between relationships, social integration, things like that, and mental health problems and addictions. There's a whole sociology out there going all the way back to Emil Durkheim that does just that. And the data are amazing, and the, the, the implications are interesting. But if you would look for the word brain in all that work, you'd be hard-pressed to find it. And worse still, if someone like me would bring up the word brain and say that maybe we should try to understand what's going on in that organ in order to help the people with addictive disorders, there could be quite a bit of hostility among the people producing all that amazing sociology. And worse still, if you were to say that we could possibly use medications targeting the brain, such as methadone maintenance or buprenorphine maintenance, to help these people, the hostility can reach quite some impressive levels. I've lived that. It's a little bit different on the other side of the fence. Um, I personally don't know of a single neuroscientist who would have objections to the statement that social factors have an important role in mental health problems and addictions. But honestly, once we've paid lip service to that statement, we go back to the lab and we continue to study these things one brain at a time. And if you study things one brain at a time, it's very difficult to understand the role of social factors for these processes. Um, so I still wasn't getting it. But at least we entered a new cycle, and I sort of lived through that cycle of, of, of increasing knowledge about addictive processes. And it worked, I think, as you will hopefully see in a moment, as a stepping stone to get closer to finally getting it. So one of the realizations was when I was entering the field of addiction, the field had already had decades of a fantastic success story discovery of the brain reward systems, the discovery of how addictive drugs can activate these systems and provide very strong incentives for people to seek and take drugs that will ultimately compete out healthy behaviors. And so it had become the dogma of the field that drugs make people addicted by doing just that and hijacking the brain. And it's an interesting story because Intellectually, it's been a fantastic journey. It's given us a tremendous understanding of processes of normal motivation and goal-oriented behavior. And I can tell you as a physician, it's given us nothing in terms of advances in how we can treat people with addictive disorders. And if you think about it as a clinician, or even more as a patient or a relative to a patient, it's not that strange. These things are important in the early stages. A lot of people take drugs. Yeah, they do get kicks out of them. Of course, that's an important reason why people take drugs. But among the people who take drugs, we know that's about only 50 to 20% who progress to developing addiction. And that process takes time. The average alcohol addicted patient, by the time they seek treatment, they've been addicted for over a decade. And that just goes for the people who ultimately do seek treatment, because most people don't. 
By the time that decade has passed, we're in a very different scenario. At that time, the kicks are gone. It's burnt out. And the situation you have instead is a very different one. It's one in which the brain stress and aversion systems have turned up the dial to the point that in the absence of drug, people feel miserable. And they, of course, have had a long time to learn that there is a quick fix to avoid that feeling of misery, and that is to resume drug taking. So unless we can offer other options to turn off that aversive, unpleasant state, that incentive will remain and will drive behavior. And we haven't gotten that message. Well, maybe we have started getting it. Maybe the last decade has brought a new realization that brain stress and aversion systems are probably more important in the later stages of addiction than the brain reward systems. But we still haven't gotten what kind of stressors that are important. Uh, before I get to that, you know, are you just taking my word for this? How do, we, how do we know that people with addictions actually turn up these stress and aversion systems? As I worked as a psychiatrist and neuroscientist over the years, I've developed more and more skepticism about our ability, and this just doesn't count for patients, it counts for me and everyone else, our ability to tell each other what's going on in our brains. And so the ability to image the function of the living brain with all its flaws and all the seductive power of pretty pictures actually is an amazing opportunity to bypass those layers and take a look. And so let's take a look and see if my statement that the brain aversion systems turn up as people become addictive is true. And here you, you have some data from my friend Dan Homer and his then trainee Jody Gilman, who's now a professor at Harvard. And Dan and Jody nailed this down very beautifully showing, by showing people these aversive, unpleasant pictures that are being shown to experimental subjects all over the brain. And as that is done, that activates the, the, the systems in the brain that process stress and aversion. And you can see the, in the upper row that the alcohol-addicted patients really turn on their systems much more than normal healthy volunteers. And in particular, you see a structure out there in the deep in the temporal lobe that we will revisit, which is the insula. And that should have been a message, and I still wasn't getting it. OK. So as addiction plays out, there is a connection that's set up between stress and drug seeking and, and, and a desire to take drug. There is probably the, a, a more powerful example of that than anything else in the comorbidity of post-traumatic stress disorder and alcohol addiction and other addictions. This is from a st the particular story I have in mind here that's illustrated by this photo is, is an American officer that came to us after having been deployed to one of the wars. And some of his guys had been blown up by this explosive device. By the time he came to us, he had to down a whole bottle of whiskey every night in order to have the guts to go to bed and face the nightmares that would haunt him. And so, you know, one of our research assistants would extract his story when he came to the unit. Uh, based on a manual, she would build this five-minute script that retells the story with all the important features. And one month later, we would sit him down and we would play this story back to him. And you won't be surprised to hear that that provoked a tremendous anxiety and distress. But it's not obvious that this should also provoke a tremendous craving for alcohol. Yet, yet you see in a whole group of patients like that, that that effect is very striking in, in that graph. And it's a long-lasting and very, very distressing state. Uh, we can turn this off. So uh, we were playing around with some experimental medications, some anti-stress medications. You can see in the upper row here, again, back in the magnet, we're showing aversive pictures to people. They're activating their insula uh, because they are people with alcohol addiction. That's the upper row. They're receiving sugar pills. And then the lower row is three weeks of treatment with an anti-stress medication. And you can see that we can completely prevent the activation of these brain circuits. And as we do that, there is a correlate of that in the behavior. Because as we try to provoke cravings for alcohol in these people, and we can do it by stressing them and then exposing them to the smell and, 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 and look of, of their favorite beverage, in the absence of the treatment, they, they, we provoke these very strong cravings for alcohol. And as we dial down the brain stress and aversion systems in these people, those cravings will be much lower. 
So, okay. But, uh, you know, the question is, what are the relevant stressors? And as we've been studying the, this in rats and mice, the stressors that we tend to use are very simple. They're physical stressors. There's a mild, mild electric buzz or an aversive odor or something like that. And that is not the stressors that are relevant for humans. Group living, social primates such as ourselves, the greatest stressor is being excluded from the group. And that is, of course, something that happens in addiction, and it's illustrated here. One reason I think this has received too little attention scientifically is that it's not all that easy to study. Uh, you know, how do you study social exclusion in the tunnel of the, of the MRI camera? Well, there are some ingenious ways of doing that. The, uh, Naomi Eisenberger and her husband at UCLA have been at the forefront of this already a decade ago. They were able to take a silly little video game that had been out already before, Cyberball, uh, with, where you toss a ball around between these little cartoon characters, and then all of a sudden they stop passing the ball to you, and it's amazing how well-adjusted college students and college faculty become distressed when, when, when they don't get the ball tossed to them. And then they migrated this into the, the magnet. And when they did that, it became possible to induce this, at least the slight level of social exclusion. And when that happened, you saw an activation of a couple of brain structures. And I don't know how good your anatomy is, but one of those two structures that are, that are lighting up there is our old in friend, the, on the insula. More importantly, the combination of these two structures that light up is a signature that people had seen before. Because, of course, if you make people feel pain, simple physical pain, that's exactly, or not exactly, but pretty much the signature that you would see, these two, two structures. Now, there's recent debate how, how identical or non-identical are these two signatures. It's clear that they're not exactly the same, but they're very strongly overlapping, and the activation of the insula is a common element of these networks that get activated. Um, why is that interesting? Well, the insula is a fan fantastically fascinating structure. It makes you feel what's going on inside your body, and it induces these emotions, the purpose of which is, of course, to make you act to fix whatever feels wrong, right? Homeostatic emotions. Um, but it's also doing a lot of other things. It's involved when you make decisions under conditions of uncertainty and you need to take risk. And we know that that's an important element of addictive disorders, taking an unreasonable level of risk in order to receive an immediate reward. But more importantly, the connection is pretty much nailed down by the set of observations that tell us, tells us that when we induce cravings for whatever drug a person is addicted to, that is... Uh, associated with an activation of the insula. You see that here on the sides in the temporal lobe. This, in this case, this is alcohol addiction, but the fascinating thing is that this, this could be heroin, this could be cocaine, this could be nicotine. Now, this is, of course, a correlation, right? Correlation does not equal causation. Uh, but it's suggestive. And then, of course, this beautiful study came around, this case series of patients who had had stroke, and some of them had stroke that affected their insula. And lo and behold, those that had the stroke in that location were able to quit smoking, and they would not feel any cravings. So this was from Antoine Bechara and his then trainee, Nakvi. And it doesn't established, but it strongly suggests that the relationship between the activity of this insula and the cravings that people feel is actually causal rather than just a correlation. And so here we're beginning to come back full circle. A recent French study took people with alcohol addiction and exposed them to social exclusion in the magnet. And it compared the activity of the insula in these people with the activity that got induced in healthy volunteers. And you can see here that the activity in the alcohol-addicted patients is stronger. So if you think about all this and try to put it back together, it really makes up for a terrible, terrible vicious circle. Because, of course, if the activity of the insula is associated with people having cravings, that will promote relapse. If that's driven by stress, well, then more stress, more insula activity, more, more drug-seeking, and, uh, and relapse. But as people relapse, they, of course, 
cannot function socially as well as they're expected to, neither in the family domain, no in the work domain, guess what? They'll be socially excluded more and more. They'll lose their home, they'll lose their family, they'll lose their job. Well, if we are to believe this, this set of, of, of causal relationships that will promote uh, this, the activity of precisely the stress systems that drive the craving for drugs, and you can see the vicious circle. And I think, I think this is the scientific account of what we're seeing in this image that from, from that music video by Everlast. I think that this is pretty much the story I wanted to tell you. But I'd like to end on a note. You know, sometimes it gets questioned whether the taxpayers should spend all this money on neuroscience to uh, address the issues of addiction. And you know the hopes are, of course, that our work will lead to the discovery of medications or other treatments that will help patients in new ways. I still have that hope. I intend to spend the rest of my career trying as hard as I can. But I also realize the level of challenge. And I realize we haven't been as successful as we would have hoped. But you know what? Even if we don't produce a single new medication, this is a worthwhile effort. And I'll tell you why. Because as we are able to understand and explain to the public and the policymakers the brain mechanisms that make people behave the way they behave, maybe we will be able to do just some little good to eliminate, eliminate judgmental, paternalistic, exclusionary attitudes and policies. And maybe ultimately we'll be able to hug an addict.